number of very good anthologies of baseball poetry. One was co-edited by one of the consultants for the Hall of Fame. It came out last year. And I think some of the things are things that you would expect in terms of the connection between writing and the con contemplating the world in baseball, in terms of there, not, there being no clock, being a, and for poets there's never a clock, which is one of our problems. And also the, the long pauses where if you don't know what's going on, you think nothing's going on on the field. And, it, and poets often look at the world the same way, where they try and see things happening where most people wouldn't see things happen. So, as Mark said, I grew up in Detroit following the Tigers, and one of the special nights we always used to have in Detroit, where there's a large Polish community, is Polish American Night. So this is called Polish American Night Tiger Stadium for my old friend Harry. And uh, just to set this up a little bit, we were friends for a long time, and then we lost touch for about 15 years, and through a fortunate occurrence, we got back in touch. And I guess this is about maybe the dreams for these young guys here out on the field in terms of how quickly things can change uh, due to an injury, but also how quickly things can change in life, you know, <clears throat> where you, so many things we don't have any con control over. So, Polish American Night Tiger Stadium for Harry. You and I sit with our girlfriends in general admission, feeling like old guys taking our wives to the ball game, drinking beer, eating kibasa, talking about the future. 20 years old, me, Debbie, you, Linda, the summer John Hiller hurt his knee after striking out five in a row. The summer you found out Linda liked the Carpenters, not the Kinks, and wanted to become a CPA so you couldn't possibly get married because you were obsessed with James Joyce and leaving town. And Debbie was about to come on to you one drunken night, then deny it later, only to end up marrying Mike Dombowski, who despite being Polish, was not here on Polish American Night, and despite my, being my good friend, did not resist the advances of little Debbie. No, we did not know all this, just as John Keller did not know he'll have a heart attack, but recovered a pitch well enough to become the Tigers' first star reliever, even though tonight he'll injure his knee and go out, go out for the season. The crowd subdued after that, the kibasa greasy and the wind cold. Debbie and Linda want to leave early, so we do, without putting up a fight. And it started out so good, feeling a little like old guys taking our wives to the game. Every time you pitch, there's a certain risk involved. Years later, you look back and can't figure it out. Like what happened to our friendship. But I'm glad you wrote me after so many years to find we still have much in common. And we both have wives who never liked the car carpenters and can be counted on not to come on to our friends. <laughs> who would have known Karen Carpenter was starving herself to death with all that sugary love? Maybe that's what we were beginning to learn that night. The loss can come on suddenly just by bending your leg the wrong way. And uh, another one is a book. And I, I had a poem in there about a baseball card of Jake Wood, who still holds the Tigers record for most strikeouts in a season, for a batter, not a pitcher. And, uh, what city the Tigers play? Well, I think they say it's Detroit, I guess. Uh, and uh, so there was an art show in New York where somebody made a giant baseball card of Jake Wood and had my poem and calligraphy next to it. And they invited Jake Wood to come down. He was working at a department store in New Jersey, and so I got an autograph. Uh, copy the program from, from Jake. So talking about thing, things coming full circle. It's great. Jake Wood come through Jake? No. no. Uh, and this is about growing up and playing baseball. And I don't know if you like, some of you, some, some of you I think must have done this where you, you just played baseball in the field. It wasn't uh, officially a uh, baseball field. You made your own baseball with diamond. Ball, with black tape all around. Oh yeah. Yeah, the electric thing. And uh, we, we made our own field behind uh, this one street, and it shows up in the poem, and later became a bowling alley. And, uh, we were very disappointed, but this is about uh, my, fir my fir very end of the field, where we just imagined one day we'd get, up, we'd get big enough and strong enough to hit one over that road, but he moved before that. 
We stood in our field of weeds as cars passed on Ryan Road, the traffic hiss suddenly audible, like the moment last winter when we realized the snowbank entombed a dead dog. A dead dog that ran away and looked where it got him. Kevin's dad had gotten transferred. We didn't know anything about dying or moving. We stood under the big tree behind home plate of the diamond we'd hacked out of weeds. Cold and we could have used gloves. He told me the news and neither of us felt like fetching flies. We each held a bat and hit rocks, rocks you didn't have to retrieve. Spring and small streams of mud flowed down the base paths. The rocks landed where they landed. You can say all you want about it being no big deal. You can be like our parents. You think we were going to write letters, talk on the phone? We weren't going to get older, not for each other. No one ever hit one over Ryan Road, though we imagined we would someday. We'd measured the bases, 90 feet exact. We didn't know anything about rivers. I still couldn't tell you where the nearest river was, but I have lived next to rivers since. Some days you suddenly hear water rushing past as if you never heard it before. We stood together, suddenly hearing the traffic on Ryan, and I knew we could never stop the sad, beautiful sound of goodbye that cars make and rivers. Nice. And uh, if I'd known I, I was going to be asked to do this, I would have brought the little book of baseball poems. Um, well, but, I, I uh, just wonder we should get your son there. He wants to go out and be uh, right He doesn't have to hear me. Hear me. I just have one more. Okay, no, I, I'll take him over. How are we doing? Are you, are you comfortable going out with Joe? Go ahead, Rand. Rand against. Uh, I, so we well, see the games in Pittsburgh. I, I organized a school trip for Ramsey School. We're sitting out the bleachers, and half the kids are just watching the giant screen <laughs> instead of the ball field. And uh, so this is kind of a rant against some of the uh, entertainment that you get at a big league ballpark and how loud they play the music. Jumbotron. I haven't drawn pencil lines on the wall to mark my children's laughter like the damn noisometer at the ballpark egging us on to cheer louder as if the urge to watch an electronic stick rise is patriotic. My children's laughter rings and bubbles and trills off any scale. If I could make them laugh like that at some random insufferable committee meeting, I'd burn down the wax museum just to watch the flames <laughs> and inhale a church full of sins. We were asked to vote for what mediocre old rock song we'd like to hear between innings, three choices on the scoreboard. I silently cast a right in for silence. We wait breathlessly to see what fat, shirtless moron will appear on the big screen jiggling like an autistic marionette. So why am I here and what will I retrieve like a tired old dog? I love baseball, did I tell you that? The pirate parrot shoots hot dogs into the crowd with a mammoth bazooka. If he sits on my lap again, I swear I'll take his head off. Yes, it's true, I tell my children, sitting dazed beside me with their mitts, choking on stale popcorn, but it's not the same parrot I knew. I used to drink with the old parrot down at Silky's. Once I put on the suit, Santa Claus is a concept, I explain. <coughs> I keep score with the nubby old pencil I brought myself. Pretty soon it'll be like bowling, they'll electronically fill in your scorecard. That'll give you more time to dance between innings. The organist drowns out spontaneous rhythmic applause, and I stop clapping. I make my children stop clapping. They do not understand why I'm so cranky and can't get out of my serious face. When I tell them we have to stay till the last out, they demand more refreshments. Look at the grass. Have you ever seen grass like that, I say? They're five and six and love only primary colors. <laughs> In the post-game traffic jam, their backseat laughter rolls over me with the sticky shame of cotton candy and watery beer. I draw a line in the dust on the dashboard. Their gloves are empty, and I have nothing to say. So. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the first one was the last two are relatively new, and I happen to have... I like writer, writers write about obsessions, and baseball happens to be one of mine, so... Uh, even if I'm upset with things going on in baseball, like probably a lot of you are, with uh, the rumors of strikes and things coming up, I still have to write about it and think about it. You have to visit Greg's museum. 